of uh, recording is in progress. So we we are now official uh, with that. But it is good to see you. Good to be, good to be with you. Um, we are continuing. Uh, just started a um, sermon series on comfort food. Uh, food is very very important in, in the scriptures. Uh, you'll see food talked about a lot, uh, both in the Old and the New Testament. Uh, obviously, uh, we carry that tradition today where we gather for meals, and it is around the table that much is done in the life of a family, in the life of, of friends who get together. And so uh, food is something that we'll be talking about for the next several weeks as we look at uh, what that means to us. But part of, part of the food thing, and, and we talk about it even in our world and culture today, is uh, what is healthy, what is not healthy. Uh, we look at it from a physical standpoint. We look at it from a spiritual standpoint. What is it that is healthy or unhealthy about the lifestyles that we lead in the way that uh, we take food in and, and how we use it within our bodies? Uh, with that. So today we're going to be looking at, in this seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark, um, criticism uh, that Jesus and his disciples are receiving from uh, legal authorities, uh, religious th authorities, as they uh, maybe aren't doing things the way that these individuals think. So uh, we're going to start, first of all, with um, the seventh chapter here, beginning with the first through the fifth verses. Then the Pharisees. Now, now, who are the Pharisees? What do they do? Any idea? They criticize others. That's, that's part of their job. Uh, but it does. They do it for a reason. Uh, they are the keepers of the the Messianic law, the Mos the Mosaic law. Uh, they are the ones that, that say, here is how we interpret those, and this is how we're supposed to live. So part of the role of the, of the Pharisees then was to keep an eye on, on people and, and keep an eye on the traditions that were there. And, and also some scribes. Now, what's, what's a scribe? They're the teachers. Uh, the, it, he had two, these two different groups who usually did not get along well, but as they began to come together to have challenges about, uh, about Jesus and his followers, we have that, that awkwardness of groups that usually don't come together, coming together because of this common concern that they have. And so we have the Pharisees, which are the keepers of the law, and then we have the scribes who are the teachers of the law. Uh, they're the ones that help interpret for them. Uh, the, the Pharisees are, are the ones that, that try to keep us in line. And so they came together, and, and they come to him, and we say Jesus in this, having come from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, obviously, is we're up in the Galilee right now, uh, and, you know, that's the northern part of Israel, uh, and near Nazareth, where Jesus was born, uh, we have the Sea of Galilee, and so most of the ministry of Jesus that we find in the, in the Gospels takes place around this immediate area. And so these folks have come from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee to check Jesus out. Now, this is a distance, again, about the distance uh, from here to Dalton. Uh, that we're talking about. It's not very far, but yet you're walking. Uh, you're not flying in on a, a local Learjet executive plane. You're not uh, taking the train. Uh, you're not, you're just walking uh, or riding in, in the case of maybe a donkey or something like this. And, and so they have come from Jerusalem, which for the Catholic church would be like somebody coming from Rome, coming from the Vatican. This is the religious center right now of the world is in Jerusalem. So these folks are coming, or for us in the United Methodist Church, somebody from Nashville has shown up. Uh, are you aware that the, Nash the global headquarters for the United Methodist Church is in Nashville? Um, the general boards and agencies, there's also some in Evanston, Illinois. There's also some in Washington, DC. Uh, there's also some here in Atlanta. Uh, the General Board of Global Ministries uh, moved into the building there on uh, Grace United Methodist Church. 
And so that's where that's headquartered. So, but the primary offices for the United Methodist Church are in Nashville. Or if we're here in North Georgia, uh, it would be like somebody coming from the conference office. That's what Phil used to be. Uh, for 12 years prior to coming our senior pastor, Phil was on the conference staff and he was in charge of what used to be called um, the, the Office of Church Development. But now it's called the, the Office of Church Excellence, which was changed during during Phil's uh, tenure in there. And so it would be like somebody is an official who has come um, and, and to be there. And this is not the first time that we have seen this happen in the Gospel of Mark. Um, in, earlier in this, in the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark, uh, the 22nd verse, you have Jesus who has gone to his hometown. He has gone to Nazareth. And uh, this is, re if you remember the story, is when Jesus gets in trouble with the people that are there. They think he's gone nuts. Uh, you know, this is Mary's boy. And, and he's given us all this stuff that this different than what we've been taught. And so the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or the, uh, the scribes, then come and, and are there at that time. Uh, and they say he must be uh, related to Bezabel, uh, which is Baal. Uh, which is uh, one of the pagan gods uh, with that. And so because uh, he can drive out demons, they think that he is possessed. Uh, and so we see it earlier. So these guys have come, a different group now has come uh, with that. And so the, the concept of, of evaluating um, persons who represent the church and represent the faith were really is really not unusual. Uh, that's part of the role of the Pharisees was to validate and to vet those who are out there preaching the gospel in whatever form it might be. Uh, and so it was up then. So it was be like somebody from the board of, of ministry in the North Georgia conference coming here to hear uh, candidates for ministry preach or to hear what's going on about the life of our church and, and vetting basically what we are doing. Um, and so they're looking for false prophets. They're looking for people who are claiming to be a part of the church, but yet they're not doing things the way the church wants it done. And so for that reason, they are looking for false prophets. They're looking for false messiahs. Uh, they're looking for folks who are claiming to have authority that they may or may not actually possess. And so you have these folks coming to do that. So then now they, the Pharisees and the scribes, saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled. This is unwashed hands. Now, this is ritually unwashed, uh, and they find fault. You, you, you stepped outside of what the rules are here, folks. Uh, you stepped outside of what the expectation, the assumption is, and so for that reason, they find fault with them, and so for the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. So th there are certain rules and regulations that have come over time uh, is what we're finding in the scriptures. And so the Pharisees and the scribes have certain ways. The Pharisees really are the ones that are doing this. They're the ones that have certain ways things are supposed to be done. And so they have um, created these rituals beyond what's biblical to, to be sanctified and, and to do it in a certain way. And so it's interesting how... Uh, part of the ritual in this special way was, is that you would take water that would be enough to fill an eggshell and a half, an eggshell and a half, and you would use that water to cleanse your hands. And you would use ritual water to do that. And so they would do that and they would start, first of all, with enough water to, to do that. And they would start at the fingertips washing their hands, and they would move toward their wrist. And then once they got to that point, they would use their, their fist to clean the palms of their hands. And then they would ritually wash their hands from their wrist back to their fingertips. That was just one of the ways that they were religious, pious, uh, that's the way that they were ritually learned how to do this. And that was the proper way to wash your hands. And so they have, have done this. And so they, they're trying to hold on to the traditions that have been established 
uh, for them. And so when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. But the Pharisees and, and the scribes don't actually, um, in this instance, don't actually evaluate Jesus as properly done. Uh, they come here, and, and there's two things that, that make this kind of different. First of all, is that they have already made up their minds before they got here. They don't like Jesus. <laughs> uh, you know, you have this team of people that are supposed to come and watch what he's doing to make decisions and to either vet him or not vet him as a speaker for the, the faith. And they've already made up their decision before they get there. Um, and I don't know if you've had that happen or not in your life, where before you even got there, somebody had read your resume, somebody had heard from other people about you, and they go kind of through the motions of the evaluation, or they go through the motions of the hiring or whatever. And the bottom line is they've already made up their decision. They're just going through, through the process. And that's kind of what we have here. Um, and, they, and the other part of that is that they didn't really measure Jesus and his disciples against what's in the scriptures. They're measuring it, as you remember here, uh, that they are holding the tradition of the elders as the litmus test. It's not what's in the scripture. It's what has become the commonplace in the, in the known for these folks. And so the religious leaders um, might elaborate on, on this ceremonial washing that, that we have uh, that, that keeps them for the sake. And it's not that they're washing necessarily for cleanliness, they're doing it ritualistically. And, and there's also some traditions in this that you first of all washed your hands to make them clean, and then you would ritually wash them to be relig religiously clean. Uh, with this. And so this is going through uh, kind of a process that they do that to, to, to ritually do that. Now, we've talked before in here about ritual cleaning is different than cleanliness. Ritual cleaning is going through the process. And even though the water uh, is supposed to be clean, at times it may not be. Uh, you've heard me talk about before the, the, the mikvah bath that the Jews had where they would go and before they went to worship, they would go into the mikvah bath, they would cleanse while they are there ritually, and then they would come out. They would go in one way, come out the other way, as that they do not retrace their steps. The, the, the dirty person goes in, the clean person goes out. Well, this water has been used by several people. Uh, and so it's not that you're getting bath clean, it is you're getting ritually clean. And you'll see if you go to a lot of rich religious places today, uh, there is a washing station outside before you go in. And for us in the United States, this is very comparable to what we have as the what? Saturday night bath that used to take place uh, before one went to worship on Sunday morning. There would be a ritual cleaning. And some of us grew up with that, that ritual cleaning. Well, the thing is, again, that ritual cleaning uh, would start sometimes uh, with the elder of the family would be the first one to take their bath. And then the next person would use the same water. And then the next person would use the same water. Uh, and because a lot of times water was sparse, especially during droughts or whatever. But the, the fact that we were washing before we went to worship was very important. Uh, and it's the same that on Sunday morning, after having the Saturday night bat, you would still have to do your chores before you went to church. But you would have ritually bathed for this, this uh, Sunday morning experience uh, with that. And that's kind of what's going on with these guys here. Uh, they also had a special prayer that they would do when they did the ritual cleaning. They would say, be blessed thou, O Lord. King of the universe, who sanctify us by the laws and commanded us to wash the hands, which is not biblical, but became a part of that. So the biblical mandate for washing actually goes back to the days of the tabernacle. Uh, you've heard about the tabernacle. We've talked about that a lot before, that before they went into the tabernacle, there would be the ritual washing. And so this then just got carried over. Well, if it's good enough to do it going to the the, going into the tabernacle, then it also is good enough before we eat. And it even got to the point where there would be ritualistically cleansing between each course of the meal. They would do this cleansing again 
uh, is, but it's all ritualistic is what, is what Jesus is trying to get at as we go with this. So, uh, and then there, we're moving on then, and there are many other things which they have received in whole, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches in some translation, which means beds. Uh, they would ritually wash the things that they used. And the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Again, they're not saying we're doing it because of the scriptures. We're doing it because this is what is the tradition. Um, but there's also the biblical tradition, but there's also the oral and written laws that kind of get thrown into this mix too. Uh, but eat bread with unwashed hands. Um, everybody's growing up with all these traditions. Uh, and, and we have this thing where, where every place is kind of different. Uh, some people do it this way, some people do it that way. And so the great body of traditions, and the traditions that originally were interpretations of the law, because people would say, well, this is what the law says, but what does that really mean? Do we wear a mask or not our mask? In, in what rooms can we wear a mask and what rooms can't we wear a mask? Uh, you know, we, we are trying to figure out the best way to do things. And that's what's happening here is for our situation and our history and our tradition, what is the best way to be religious? What is the best way to be righteous in this? And so they have the traditions that have come out of that because people have tried to interpret what that means for this location here. You know, what do we do differently at Dunwoody United Methodist Church than Dunwoody Baptist Church does? What are our traditions? What are the things that, that hold us there? So, and what are the circumstances in which we find ourselves? So the traditions which it become uh, the primary thing is that then they have traditions that then have applications to those traditions. And it goes on and on and on to where you have interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. Uh, you know, this thing just keeps growing and, and that's what Jesus is, is kind of getting to as we go with this. And the Apostle Paul, if you remember, runs into this a lot. Uh, as the Apostle Paul is out in the world and going to all kinds of churches and starting churches, place, place, many of his letters have to deal with this same kind of thing. You know, okay, well, what about circumcision? Do we do it or not do it? Do you have to become Jewish before you become a Christian? Uh, if you're a Gentile, is the door open for you or not open for you? Uh, to become a part of the church. How are you going to do this? And so Paul is writing all these letters to different places to try to help people understand from his understanding what it means. And a lot of that, again, is based on where the church is, what the situation is that the folks are doing. Uh, if you remember in the church of Corinth, part of what's going on is that the women are, are creating a problem within the church. Um, they're, they're gossiping about one another, uh, and that's undermining the church. Uh, and so that's part of what's going on here. So, and also the special, the thing that's great about this is some of you coming from Jewish traditions or uh, are familiar with, with Jewish folks in your family that uh, have different dishes for Passover for meals than they do for everyday life uh, because those are sacred, those are, are kosher. Uh, with that. And you only use them for certain times and certain things. And so you have the, the, the Pharisees here who have special cups, who have special pitchers that were created to be used because ordinary cups and, and ordinary pitchers and ordinary copper vessels and whatnot may not actually be as clean as we think they are. So we have special ones that we set aside that only used for certain things. Uh, and so they may or may not actually be clean. Uh, so we have to have other things that would help us be clean. Uh, then we move on to the sixth through the eighth verses here. And he said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites. Ever heard that in the church? I don't go to church because of all the hypocrites who are there. Uh, you know, whatever it might be, as it is written, uh, the people, the, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrine, putting again all these rituals, all these things before us uh, that are not really a part of the, the church 
uh, biblical history, but it's something that we have adopted. You abandon the commandment of God to human tradition instead of our uh, godly one. And, and that's part of what we run into, too, is our interpretation of things and what is important to us. And, and then we begin to impu- infuse that to others. Uh, hypocrites is, is a theater term. Um, and I don't know if you remember that or not, which means uh, the, the definition of a hypocrite is someone who wears a mask. Remember that from your, your, uh, your theology or your... Uh, your history classes with that. Uh, Jesus spoke strongly because these leaders were far too concerned with the trivial matters of ritual washing than they were of being the church. Uh, When they focused on these things, they excluded everyone who didn't keep the traditions. So this is creating innies and outies. Uh, You're either for us or you're against us based on the way that we do things. They honored God with their lips but their hearts were not true with God. Ooh, forgive me, Lord, for I am a sinner. You know, there's times that, that I say it that maybe it really isn't here. And, and when would God say the same thing about us? You know, when is it that we give lip service to God? Yes, I'm a part of the church. Yes, I'm going to go with what the church needs and wants. I need to be faithful to my faith, but... I'm not really going to be helpful to this group over here. I'm not going to do this thing over here. And so um, maybe Jesus would say about us is is that they attend church, but their heart's not really with me. They read their Bible, eh, but they're not really with me. They pray eloquently, as we heard Phil did. (laughs) Uh, But maybe our hearts are not truly there. Uh, we contribute money to the life and the ministry of the church, but maybe our hearts are not tied to that. Um, we do ministry, but maybe our hearts aren't there. We love to sing, Fran. <laughs> we love to sing, but our hearts are not there. They talk about Jesus, we, but their hearts aren't there. You know, where can we find ourselves in situations where we're, we're saying it out there, but we're not really living it the way that God would want us to live our lives. And then we go to the 14th and 15th verses. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things they come out are what defile. And obviously, we, we see this as we immediately think about taking food in and, and excreting the, the leftovers of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that, that also can enter us uh, in our lives that are not food related, but potentially can defile us. Uh, but in the context, Jesus spoke about ceremonial cleaning uh, as a part of this as in regard to food. Jesus implies in, in Acts that Um, Jesus anticipated a time in the new covenant when all the food will be declared kosher. You know, all the food is good. All the food that we take in. Um, But the fundamental principle is is very simple here, is is eating with unclean hands is not really going to defile us as such. Um, Ritualistic cleaning does not make the food itself either good or not good for us. Uh, rather, what, what comes out is what defiles us and reveals what is unclean. And, and that's what's unclean in our hearts. Um, and that's part of what Jesus begins to do. He, he's helping us try to, to, to discern between what is ritualistically law and what is truly in our hearts. And then we move to the 21st through the 23rd verses here. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Things like fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, which is extreme greed, wickedness, deceit, a sensuousness, uh, which is looking or lacking moral and or legal integrity, um, 
envy, slander, pride, folly, 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 all these things, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So it's not just what we take in in food, it's, it's what we take in and all the other things in our lives. And a number of these things that are listed on the list by Jesus obviously are part of the Ten Commandments. The, those laws which are the basic laws that we begin. And, and part of what I think he's trying to remind us is in, in the beginning of this, uh, as the Exodus story begins and Jesus or God gives to the, the Israelites the Ten Commandments, here's how I expect you to live my life. And then we have later on uh, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, this long list of additional requirements then that get thrown into this thing. It goes from 10 to, to over 600 uh, of all these things that you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. So um, a number of the sins that are here are from the Ten Commandments. The others are rooted in the teachings of the Old Testament. And Jesus continues to insist on redirecting uh, the concerns of the Pharisees and the scribes away from the authority of their traditions, but back to the authority of the scripture, of what God calls us to do. And so in a time when people are emphasizing piety, honoring God with religious duties, Jesus changes the emphasis then to ethical behavior. Um, some would call it an emphasis of what's in your heart versus what's in your head. Uh, part of what Jesus reforms for us is, is, is just not what you do, it's why you do it and how you do it and what's in your heart that makes the big difference. So um, we are to nurture what is holy, that's in our hearts, uh, and not the evil things that can come into our hearts. Uh, you know, we have to keep a clean heart as well as a clean body. And what are emphasis, the emphasized ministries here uh, are that they are especially vulnerable. The, the things that we call or call to be and do in the life of the church are those things, those ministries to the hungry and the thirsty and the lonely and the sick and the imprisoned, those basic things that God calls us to be a part of and to serve. So remembering uh, food itself is not what it's going to defile us. Uh, it is what is we do with that? What is it we do with this food that we take in both spiritually and physically? And how does it equip our hearts to be faithful to Christ? So we're going to, uh, I guess, stay around our table groups. Uh, the question should be thrown up upon the screen there. Um, so I'll uh, let Andy let you do the rest that you need to do here, but uh, spend some time uh, with these three questions that you might have that you can fend around the table. Discuss among yourselves. Okay, for the folks on Zoom, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm gonna break us up into two groups. And let me grab the questions, put them in the chat. And we're gonna pretend that, that I'm as facile with Zoom as Mark Freund is, which I'm not. So uh, if y'all be patient. Hey, Justin Wingo, it's good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Okay. And then we'll go uh, 